Hello, and welcome to today's Textile Talk. I am Marin Hansen, Curator of International Collections at the International Quilt Museum. Textile Talks are presented by the International Quilt Museum, Quilt Alliance, Studio Art Quilt Associates, and Surface Design Association. We love bringing these free programs to you every week, thanks to the support of our sponsors and contributions from viewers like you. A few, a few Zoom notes before we begin. This is a webinar and we cannot see or hear you, but we can read your comments in the chat. And I'm seeing that some people are reporting in from hot and humid locations, maybe stormy locations. We just had storms roll through here in Nebraska yesterday, so uh, we, can, uh, we can certainly relate. Um, if you have any questions during today's program, please type them into the Q&A function, and we will have some time for questions at the end of the program. If you have suggestions for ways we can improve or for topics you would like to see in future textile talks, please let us know in the post-event survey, which will be emailed to you. We have closed captions turned on for this program. You can turn these on or off by finding the live caption or CC button in your settings. So today's textile talk is on the topic of placemaking, textiles and the creation of special spaces, which is also the title of an exhibition we currently have on view here at the International Quilt Museum which is located on the campus of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. The exhibition will be up through September 30th, so please come and visit us if you have the chance. I am joined today by my colleague, Camilo Sanchez, who is the International Quilt Museum's Curator of Exhibitions. Hi, Camilo. We, uh, he and I today want to talk about the concept of place and placemaking, specifically in reference to the global textiles we currently have on view in our galleries, but also in the larger sense of how museums regularly engage in creating or, or perhaps mimicking a sense of place through their exhibitions. So we'll be talking sort of on a, a more meta level uh, as well. So to get started, uh, we just wanted to talk a little bit about this concept of place. What is placemaking? Uh, and place, the, the idea of placemaking really is based on the idea of place being more than, it's more complex than simply a physical location. So uh, many social scientists in particular uh, have been studying the concept of place for a long time, geographers uh, especially, and it's more than just the physical location of a, of a space, more than sort of geophysical data or, um, you know, ge geographical coordinates or just a description of the physical location. It's more than that. It's, it, it, it has a much larger sense to it. Um, and so in terms of geography, it definitely has to do with things like, like in, tangible and intangible characteristics of, a, of an area. So it can include, you know, sounds or smells, the activities of a location, you know, what the climate is, and in fact, you know, what the history of a place is. And all of those things have to do largely with how humans interact with that environment. Um, whether they are acting upon it or acting in reaction to it, somehow it has to do with humans and and their uh, interaction with a space. And yeah, sorry, Camila, if you could go to the previous slide then, I was talking out of order here. Um, it's also a concept that has become really common you know, sort of in urban planning. Uh, and when you look up the idea of placemaking online, there are lots of different organizations, nonprofits, um, all focused on uh, urban planning or, or creating urban spaces with humans in mind. So you can see that uh, the project for public space, the way they define placemaking, 
is a participatory process for shaping public space that harnesses the ideas and assets of the people who use it. So it's, uh, it's the idea of creating areas, creating urban spaces that respond to um, and are, are made through the participation of the people who actually live there. Placemaking Chicago says that it is a people-centered approach to the planning, design, and management of public spaces. And the Congress for New Urbanism uh, defines placemaking as the process of creating quality places that people want to live, work, play, and learn in. So really, again, it's, it's this idea that place is so much larger than just a physical uh, location. Uh, that, that a place is not simply defined by the hard, nailed down uh, furniture, so to speak, of a place, but that a place really is about the feelings, the interactions, the um, ideas that people bring to that location. So again, geographers, um, anthropologists, sociologists, uh, all sorts of academics have been talking about this larger, broader concept of place for a long time. And it's something we wanted to explore in our own museum. Um, and it's something that museums engage in all the time, whether or not they are doing it, um, knowing it or, or, or are doing it in a very, uh, focused way, they are, museums are always engaging in this um, activity of placemaking, particularly in exhibition development. So Camilo is joining me today because we wanted to kind of dig into that idea a little bit, the, the paradoxes, as you will see, as we talk about a museum trying to recreate a, a place, or as I said earlier, perhaps just mimicking. Uh, we'll see as we discuss this a little bit further. So Camilo has a long uh, history in uh, museum exhibition design, uh, as well as just visiting museum e exhibitions all over the world. He has harnessed his vast collection of museum exhibition documentation. So we'll be sharing some images with you of uh, exhibitions from museums all over uh, who have, have engaged in placemaking perhaps more or less successfully. <laughs> so Camila, let's get started in talking about the museum paradox. Yeah, so basically every, well, most exhibitions that any museum do try to give context to something that is not meant to be in a space like a museum. So right. everything in a museum is decontextualized geographically, temporally, and most of the cases, both. So museums are essentially artificial spaces. And right. this in this example is the British Museum with the Elgin marbles. And it's kind of funny to see a space that is not contextualized on purpose because this is where they should be where they should be <laughs> and right. this is in athens uh next to the parthenon uh and it's the acropolis museum so even if you're next to the place you want to recreate it feels strange so um recreating a place and most museums try to recreate a time, is not easy. This is an exhibition about Giotto in Amsterdam. Uh, so recreating that space is difficult. Recreating the feeling of a place is just impossible. And Right, because those two things are very different, right? Just simply recreating a space is one thing, but how do you ever um, mimic or reference the feeling that someone has walking into a space yep. like that. Yeah, so museums try to do that all the time to find solutions to give visitors enough context to interpret 
whatever they, this, the story they want to tell. So we have several examples. And this is a funny example in a children's museum because you can go very literal uh, on trying to recreate that any kind of space. In this case, it was an exhibition about Greece. So you were transported to Indianapolis, to Athens, and they had even the plane. So you can jump in the plane and travel far away. Uh, but then on, not only in children's museums you have this, you have this recreation in very prestigious art museums. I'm not saying this is bad, or good, I'm just saying they're exhibition designs alternatives. Sometimes they're very well done and very well intended. Sometimes they're not. Uh, you right. find- I, So, I, but I mean, it can be dangerous trying to be that literal, right? Well, the more, the more, the more literal you wanna go, the more defects you're gonna have because it's just impossible to recreate the feeling. So this is a very good, like you're in the middle of Philadelphia and you step into a medieval cloister from Europe. So it is very artificial, although it's very well done. It's also convincing to a certain extent. Yeah, so yeah. You, you have a lot of, this kind of recreation in historical museums uh, where you have a neighborhood, a street. Uh, and this is a good example of a recreation of a Spanish fort uh, in Florida. And it, it mixes a little bit of everything. And I have always find that recreating water it's impossible. So, <laughs> so it's always interesting to see how water gets recreated when try to do this contextualization of objects. Uh, I choose this one in the Tropic Museum in Amsterdam because it, it deals with fabric, which is our main concern in the textile talks. Right. But they have a whole recreation of the streets of Mumbai. So it, it is quite interesting. And also you could do it just with graphics and try to recreate. In, in this case, it's the time and the place. And I think in this case, it works very well. Like you see those objects with different eyes, thanks to those interpretation. Absolutely. It and it, it seems like this could be a fairly um, a simple but elegant approach. Uh, it maybe wouldn't break the bank for an exhibition either. Yeah, but you can always go crazy and do the cloisters. <laughs> uh, in New York, that's a 1930s project and it was fashionable at the time. I would say that a contemporary museum wouldn't take this approach of recreating uh, trying to incorporate real elements of French uh, medieval buildings into a fake building hmm. in New York. Uh, but then you can also go crazy in the 70s, as in the Getty Villa, which is like a kind of Hollywood style Roman villa. Uh, right. So you can go pretty far with this contextualization of objects. Uh, but also you can evoke places without having to be this literal. And I'm just gonna go really fast through these examples of recreating of spaces. Uh, so you can give a context to religion, even in the architecture, you can use graphics to kind of do that placemaking of where a relic should go in a church. Um, this is a very nice example of a, some context for that object. Right. Um, this is a 16th century bed, uh, Dutch bed, uh, which may 
I, I think it makes more sense to Dutch people than non-Dutch people. <laughs> and obviously it's in a Dutch museum. Uh, this is a project I did with a medieval kind of reconstruction just using medieval arcs and shapes and architectural shapes. So, and this is a very nice example of when you see like the water tanks and just the skyline of New York. This is also a recreation of a trench, which is not easy to recreate. I don't, um, I think the greatest example of this is the Blitz experience in the Imperial War Museum in London, because it's not just the recreation of the space, but the smell, the sound, like you walk into a movie set. Right. Um, and this, I think this is a great example of that placemaking with just the shape of the carpet, even though you're in a convent that it was turned into a museum. Uh, as I said before, recreating water is always difficult. And this is a very interesting example. And also you could do it with, uh, uh, I don't know, bottle boxes. I don't know what those are. Like, yeah. yeah, so that's very fun. Uh, but you also, if you don't have that much money, you can recreate water with just bubble wrap. And that's <laughs> what they did in this exhibition. And I'm just going to, um, this is the last one I'll do, uh, because this is a, this was iconic in the 90s, and it's the Gallery of Evolution in Paris. And I mean, I think there's no better way of trying to emulate eyes that what they did here because it's just a cold piece of glass that you get it that that bear leaves in the ice you don't need to recreate perfect eyes so um as i said it's not good or bad but you have to keep in mind always that being too literal accentuates that artificiality. Uh, so right. the challenge well, that we had. Yeah. And can I just want to talk a little bit more generally before we go into the specifics of our museum's challenge. And we had many uh, considerable challenges. But you, I mean, in all of those slides that you were just showing us, there were different sort of degrees, as you said, of literality. And what what do you think is the biggest challenge for an exhibition designer? I mean, is it simply budget? We can only afford bubble wrap to mimic water. Or is it, I mean, is it that we, that museums need to think in new ways about creating a, a uh, sense of place or? I think, every exhibition is different and every museum is different and the community that it serves is different right. so sometimes you're just trying to save money uh, for the exhibition to be possible sometimes you're being super political at the, as the british museum exhibition of the elgin marbles because decontextualizing on purpose the Elgin marbles is saying they don't belong in Greece. They belong in a museum. Right, right. Like so they're they're confronting so, the legacy of colonialism or the colonial uh, yeah. So so legacy. You wouldn't. Ex I don't know. It, that's a very tricky question because I would think that the more money you have for an exhibition, you'll be tempted to go more literal that's not well i mean that's not my personal option right <laughs> right uh growing up in colombia i remember the obsession of people with celebrating christmas with snow <laughs> right in a, in a tropical weather recreating snow does never work right so the more literal you want to go it feels more artificial Right. So right. I don't know. I, my personal choice is not to go literal, although there are exceptional little 
Right. And then, I mean, you also talked about different audiences presenting, you know, so you have different audiences, different visitors who might respond to different approaches differently, um, which makes me think yeah. of when I was a child uh, going to the uh, Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, and they had a recreation of sort of a Victorian Chicago, Victorian era Chicago street, you know, with gas lamps and storefronts with dresses with bustles and you know it was very dim and it was a cobbled street way and I remember as a child I was completely captured by that um I really as a child felt like I had been transported to Victorian era Chicago but is that simply because I was naive and didn't you know would I look at that let's just say, uh, I think it was early 1980s or something. Would I look at that exhibition installation today and say, oh, they were trying too hard to go literal. Um, maybe they should have done something a bit more conceptual. You know, I don't know how my parents felt about that Chicago streetscape, but like, like I said, as an audience member as a, of being a child, I was, I was completely convinced. <laughs> So how yeah. do you, I mean, how do you take that into account? <laughs> Children well, versus adults and willingness to be transported, willingness to, um, yeah, to buy into this recreation of, of place. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very hard to respond because sometimes, and I'm looking at the chat and somebody wrote Holocaust Museum with just piles of shoes and then train car. It, that's a fantastic example <laughs> of how do you create an atmosphere with just some piling up stuff or not recreating to the every detail, which I've read several uh, other uh, oh, oh, sorry authors writing about well museologists talking about the Disney right Disneyfication or... Disneyfication of museums um, and sometimes like I don't know the example I show from Cincinnati it certainly does look like High Street in Disney right uh, so. As I said, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, I mean, if you go to the Getty Villa, I'll assure that 99% of people are going to have a, the greatest time. <laughs> right. If you're a scholar on Roman architecture or Roman history, maybe not that much. Right. Same with the cloisters. Uh, so if you go to the cloisters, you are in the middle of the busy city in the world and you're in this peaceful medieval kind of you feel like a monk or something right right <laughs> but then the more you know about museums and history then you're oh my god i'm standing in this pastiche of colonialism and so it's very complex to us it to, is, it to, is. To, to reply to that question. Yeah, but. sorry to, yeah, that, that, that no, was great. challenging for you. But it's something that mu you, museum people have to, museum uh, employees or, or museologists have to think about. And so that brings us to the challenge that we had as we were working with some of the textiles in our collection, all of which have at one point in their history been used by humans to create special spaces. And so Camilo uh, it yeah. came up so, with some good slides about what those challenges were. We Yeah, so we have pieces from these spaces and we wanted to evoke those places. But, uh, well, the first example is from India. Uh, this one is in Indonesia. It's actually, yes, uh, men yeah. at prayer. Um, and interestingly, as a side note, this is an image that was taken during the pandemic. And so you can see on the floor, there are X'd out areas, spaces where the, the, um, where the men were needed to be separated 
uh, during during COVID had to have their rugs um, at a certain distance apart from each other. Um, so those were some of the yeah. objects we were dealing with. And this one was certainly the most challenging, <laughs> uh, but we will show you that later. Uh, we just had a fraction of the whole space. So we had to come up with solution, with a solution for each individual object. Right. So it, yeah. big problem was the size of, uh, in this case, the, the huge Egyptian tent panels. Uh, because if you can see to the right hand of the slide, that's the height of the gallery. All right, so we had 18, we have two 18 foot Kayamiya panels, so in Egyptian applique tent panels. We have two of them on display in our galleries. And as Camilo said, our gallery uh, ceilings are only 16 feet high. Is that correct? 16 feet? Yep. Um, and so how, how do you, uh, A, there's just the logistical aspect of how do you actually mount them on the wall and then b does that get in the way of the place making you're trying to uh engage in in the gallery yep and as we were talking about in terms of place making uh geographers you know social scientists urban planners uh all of those people think about place perhaps in a different way than is in sort of everyday or colloquial usage. But what we wanted to talk about was how textiles are often really key elements in everyday creation of special spaces in, 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 in placemaking, just sort of everyday placemaking um, in terms of perhaps ceremonial spaces. A lot of the time um, textiles are used to create temporary spaces. So whether they're ceremonial or state occasions religious services, um, these textiles, because textiles are so uh, flexible, transportable, um, easy to work with, unless you're talking about 18 foot tall, um, it, it means that they can be used more easily than you know, hard surfaces, wood, uh, other sort of, yeah, more less temporary types of materials. And so they've been used by people all over the world. Um, to create these kinds of special spaces. And they give, you know, texture, they give, uh, you, you can appreciate the workmanship and the beauty of them. Um, and what they lend to a space, you know, can be like grandiosity or intimacy or, you know, a, fa a feeling of sacredness. Um, and so textiles are so uh, flexible that way, both physically and conceptually, they can be used in so many different ways. And that's exactly what we wanted to explore in the exhibition, keeping in mind that there were limitations and difficulties. Um, so just roughly speaking, this is an overhead view of the gallery and we divided each space into just sort of a different um, element or aspect. Of, of place. And in the center, we have what we're calling transformative space. Um, and that is the feeling, and there, uh, that space is evoked through uh, door hangings, essentially. So Toron, we have some Toron, Indian Toron door hangings. We have um, an Egyptian sort of a Kayamiya tourist panel. And we'll be showing a lot of these um, specific objects in a few minutes, but they're the kinds of, here we go, transformative space. These are the kinds of um, objects where you feel like when you walk under them or through them that you have entered a new space, that you have somehow, um, the area you are in has somehow transformed into something more special. Um, and these tent panels were made for tourists in the early 20th century, sort of during the, um, the tail end of the Egyptomania that uh, was experienced in the West, sort of beginning with the Napoleonic um, invasion uh, or the wars in Egypt earlier uh, in the 19th century, but definitely well into the 20th century, specifically spurred on again by the 
um, the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb. So the Egyptomania that was taking uh, place is, across the West um, was expressed in some ways by these tourist textiles. These were made specifically to sell to people who were coming to Egypt, um, spurred on by uh, the archeology span that was taking place. And um, they are, are the, the imagery is sort of a, a, just a jumble of pharaonic imagery. So it wouldn't necessarily make any sort, sort of specific sense or send any specific message, but uh, it was intended to evoke the feeling of being in Egypt and it allowed the tourists to bring something home that they could display. Um, and again, evoke that sense of being in an exotic place in a new land um, perhaps they had it uh, on a doorway in their own home in order to, yeah, help themselves and their visitors um, create that sense of, of transformation. Um, and we, in the exhibition specifically, because we had some of those limitations of, uh, and, and not wanting to try to be too literal, we like to ask questions on the labels um, and, and ask people to imagine uh, what it would be like to have uh, an object like this in their own home, but then also to think about uh, what do you think it means or meant for non-Egyptian tourists to decorate their own doorways with textiles like this one. So we wanted people to sort of place themselves in a new situation as well. So uh, by, by this visual transformation, we wanted people to also think about um, a transformed space and what that actually means. Um, we had other limitations in terms of condition, and there were a couple of Toran in our collection that were absolutely beautiful, um, one from South India uh, uh, for a, a temple doorway, but the condition was such that uh, we discovered we were unable to display it. It was just not in a uh, displayable condition, but we still felt like, and it, and it also conceptually worked with having the uh, Egyptian tourist panel for us to buy newly made Toran because they are available, commercially available, uh, made in India. Um, so we, we, we were able to pivot in that section of the exhibition and include uh, two commercially made Toran um, and then have the Egyptian tourist piece from the early 20th century, sort of at the end of a, almost a tunnel vision. We wanted people to look through and under these pieces in order, again, to evoke that feeling of being in a new space or being transformed, having the place transformed by the textiles. So that was the transformative section of the exhibition. But then as we were talking about, we have these two, absolutely beautiful Egyptian kayamiya, which are the applique tent panels. And Egypt um, has had this tradition, at least since medieval times, uh, of creating applique tent panels. And uh, there were specialists, still are specialists, um, who have trained you know, for years and years to create these tent panels. Uh, in fact, there were also people who were specially trained to install them. They were so huge. Um, that it took specialists um, to create these giant tents, which were often used for uh, maybe a royal event or a, a wedding, um, a very elevated and, and special event. Um, and so we wanted to be able to show these pieces because we did feel that they would be awe-inspiring. They're so huge. The uh, workmanship is so, phenomenal. Um, and it's almost overwhelming when you look at them in the gallery. But as Camilo said, we had these challenges of how do we physically install them? Um, and do we, how do we evoke the feeling of being in a space with the textile or with these, you know, being in a, a giant tent? Um, one of the ways we did it was by showing a historical photograph. Um, but we also I have encouraged people, you know, to interact to the extent that they can with them by maybe taking a photograph, having their friends take a photograph with them. Um, but these are just fantastic pieces that uh, warrant 
a, a long look. Um, and so we're hoping that people will both uh, get close and look at the, uh, the workmanship, the applique, uh, including the roundel in the middle, um, which would have been the name of the person who commissioned these pieces. We don't know what they were commissioned for, but we know that, they, uh, that this is likely the name of the person who commissioned the work. So they can look at the, all of this detail, but we're also hoping that they back up and just look at the um, textiles as, uh, yes, as these awe-inspiring pieces that um, sort of make them feel like a kind of small and yet uh, made more, uh, like they're in a, a, in a space that makes them feel like they're in a special uh, environment. And let's see next. Oh yeah, the next section we wanted to talk about was sacred spaces. And we have two more Kayamiya in the collection um, that we wanted to exhibit. And they're smaller, so they feel a little bit more intimate. Um, and we displayed them along with a group of prayer rugs that we have in our collection. Um, and these prayer rugs are, are quilted uh, but they're from very different parts of the world. So we combine them together um, to create sort of what we're hoping is, yes, a more intimate sacred space. Um, the, um, and again, so yes, the, the, the inscriptions on these pieces uh, are either sort of from parables or, um, or they're uh, from the Quran itself. So the one on the right, it actually is inscribed with the um, phrase, help from Allah and a victory will come soon. Nothing happens unless Allah wills it. So again, we wanted this to be more of a religious uh, evocation, um, contemplative, um, sort of talking about the fact that textiles can be used to help people feel closer to, you know, whatever spiritual, aspect that they include in their lives. So for Islamic people, obviously, uh, for, Mo for Muslims, uh, being able to have those panels uh, with Quranic inscription, but then also to have special prayer rugs, um, those are important things. And because a, a, a prayer rug is essentially sort of like a portable mosque. Um, it allows you, to, it, it allows uh, a Muslim to uh, participate in the required uh, five times daily prayer, and they're able to do it from where they are. It's a portable, a portable mosque. They're able to worship um, on site wherever they are if they're not able to get to a mosque. And so, um, textiles are such an, an intimate part of people's religious lives. We really wanted to include that aspect as well. And I think the next photo shows the actual installation. Again, showing the prayer rugs flat on the floor as they would be, um, and then in front of these beautiful applique tent panels. The one on the left, yes, is, is Persian, uh, and it's the earliest of the three of them. Uh, the one in the middle is uh, prob was probably made, probably made in Turkey, and it's in a very typical Turkish fashion, that sort of shiny satin um, fabric with brocaded uh, decoration. And the one on the right, also very typical from where it was made, uh, Rahim Yar Khan in Pakistan, um, with the fine line applique that you see in the alternating blocks, uh, alternating with patchwork is very typical of this part of Pakistan. Um, and so I love the fact that uh, not only is the place, the religious place created, but it's a very local place. It's very specific to where it was created. Um, so uh, textiles are, you know, they're so universal. Uh, they're something we can all relate to, but they are also very specific culturally, um, geographically. Again, it, it can, I, I feel like the, the prayer rugs in this case are doing the heavy lifting of the placemaking. Um, in, our, our, in our exhibition specifically, we sort of let them do the hard work and <laughs> we, we let the, put them on the ground and then step out of the way to let them uh, create this sense of religiosity or of spirituality. Um, so that was this section. 
We also had an area we called a civic space. Again, we like to, to and the, these slides are showing the questions that we've asked on our labels um, to just get visitors to think about the topic at hand or think about textiles in general and, and place making. And of course, something that I feel like must be uh, globally universal is the idea of using sheets, bed sheets, or maybe a blanket or um, you know, just other textiles that are around in the home to create a fort or a special space. You know, as a child, we I think children often feel like they don't have their own place, at least not one that they have any great amount of control over. And so creating a, a bed sheet fort in the living room is is like an act of placemaking for children. So that was the reason we wanted to ask that question is to again evoke these feelings of having done something like this in the past. But in this specific case, uh, what we were looking at is a civic space, which maybe we wouldn't think of here in the West. Or like, how do you create a, a place for civic engagement out of textiles? Well, our example um, came from Pakistan. Um, and it's a photograph from a book, um, sort of the book um, about Raleigh quilts. And I have a copy of it here by Patricia Stoddard. Um, it was included in this book. And uh, what we wanted to do was sort of recreate that space that we saw in the photograph. It was a, a gathering of a village of people. And maybe Camila, could you go ahead to that photograph? I'm sort of talking out of sequence here, but this photograph really helps uh, communicate what we were going for in, in our gallery. And that was to, find a way to um, talk about or maybe mimic the way they used quilts to bring people together. It, it was a village meeting. I don't know exactly what the village meeting was called for, what, if they were trying to solve a particular community issue, but these Raleigh quilts were all put together to create this very large space, uh, walls, ceilings, everything. And I, I feel like the people must have felt like they were in their space. It was a space that they could all relate to. These were textiles that they were familiar with. They probably knew who made them. And I, I, I would like to think that it created more of a civic feeling for them to be surrounded like that by these Raleigh quilts. And if you, Camilo, if you could just go back and show what our gallery looked like. There and we, I like this photograph because you get that sense of that feeling like you are enveloped or surrounded by these Raleigh quilts, uh, which again we're hoping people will, um, yeah, they'll be able to appreciate that that sense of community as they go inside this this small space we've created. Um, the next section that uh, we included in the gallery was what we called welcoming, a welcoming space and then a and decorative spaces. These are on the same wall in the gallery. And on one, uh, one side, we included a tushkis from Kyrgyzstan. Um, and in Kyrgyzstan and in Central Asia generally, um, these tushkis are often placed at the back of a, a yurt, so the, rounded tent type um, dwelling that lots of um, Central Asians used to use, some still used um, to, to dwell in. Um, and so a guest of honor would be placed in front of this tushkis um, and the amulet shapes, the, um, the triangular amuletic shapes descending sort of from that top band, um, the tumar, that would also sort of give even more of a special um, feeling to the, the textile and to, and it would grant that then to the, the special guests sitting in front of it. But we wanted, again, in our labels to ask people, how do you do this? How do you welcome guests into your home? Does it involve textiles? Uh, is it simply just offering them tea and coffee or do they get, you know, do they get the seat at, on the, the special chair in your living room? Um, what exactly do you go through uh, what what processes or or um, yeah what processes do you go through when you're welcoming 
um, special people into your home. So that was our welcoming section. And then next to it, we included um, another Central Asian textile. This is a, a camel flank trapping, a kuroma um, from Turkmenistan. And um, so these would have been used again on sacred occasions to decorate a camel, perhaps um, during a, a wedding procession, something like that. But we were able to utilize photographs um, antique photographs to again evoke the way in which one of these kuroma would have been used in a home because they weren't always used on a camel. Um, but using um, a photograph from the Sergei Mikhailovich Bokudin Gorsky collection, which is uh, at the Library of Congress, it's a fantastic archive, archive of photographs from Central Asia um, from the early 20th century, we were able to find a photograph that shows how these trappings would have also been used in a yurt setting. And so again, it creates a real sense of place, the sense of this is a specific handicraft that is um, embedded in our culture, embedded in our society. And it, we don't just hide it away at when we're done using it. We also use it to decorate our yurt and give, you know, give the environment this sort of enhanced feeling of place, of specific, of cultural specificity, you know, of beauty, all of those things that textiles can uh, give to a space. Um, so that is really how we um, created or envisioned our gallery space. And then once we envisioned it, how we put it into place, although of course we went through many different iterations and design development phases, um, but that's how um, it ended up coming together, coalescing. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, we really have encouraged people to interact with the space to the degree that they can. That's another one of the uh, special, <laughs> cases of working with textiles or one of the prohibitions that we have of course is relating to touch and so uh, unfortunately uh, textiles they invite uh, tactility they invite touch because of their tactile nature we can't really have people touching uh, interacting with our textiles through touch but we really wanted them to envision themselves in a space that has been enhanced through the creation of textiles. Um, and so we've encouraged them to uh, take photographs in our special photo spots. And we're hoping that they will share those um, through social media and in other ways. So that is uh, a presentation, an over, uh, overview of our exhibition, Placemaking, Quilts and the Creation of Special Spaces. And at this point, we have, yeah, about a little more than five minutes, five to 10 minutes for some questions. We would love to answer those if you have them. And if you, um, yeah, if you have questions about exhibition design or museum design, uh, certainly we would answer those and as well as about the textiles in particular. Uh, I, I was, I'm fascinated by Libby Williamson's question. How does cultural appropriation influence the exhibition environment? Well, mm. museums are the cultural appropriators by nature. So it's an, a question impossible to, <laughs> to have an answer for. It, it, it is a very difficult subject. Like you have objects that don't necessarily belong there and you're trying to give them context. So it is a very profound question. And it, believe me when I'll tell you that it's the discussions about it in museum, in the museum world are very heated because yeah, how will you deal with cultural appropriation and when you have the objects that belong to another culture? And right. How do you interpret them in such a way that you aren't trying yeah. to claim them for yourself, but are still communicating about their importance? Have you seen any exhibits that have done a good job of that? Sorry. 
have you Camilo, have I was you wondering if you had seen anybody uh, who has dealt with those issues in particular in a successful way? It's very hard to answer because sometimes you see big national museums that have uh, I would say double moral issues with the objects they own tackling these issues mm -hmm. is not I would say it, it's an exception but sometimes mm -hmm. it gets done right. right most of the times it's something museums don't want to tackle right. because it starts a lot of uncomfortable conversations. Easier especially, to avoid. <laughs> yeah, especially for museums that are, well, for the British Museum, for the Hermitage, for the Louvre, for big museums that I would say, I mean, that issue of repatriation and giving back to the original places it's something, I don't know if you heard that the Vatican gave back parts of the, the Parthenon that they had, and that put a lot of pressure into the British Museum. Right, right. Although yeah. the newly crowned king told the British Museum they could not take decisions on that matter. <laughs> okay. Well, so, so you <laughs> I see. I guess that's the end of that for now. <laughs> Yeah, so a museum discussion, it's, I mean, museums are political. Right, they are. Whether they want it or right. not. Right. I, and most right. people say, oh, museums should be neutral spaces. Ah, no, yeah. they're it's made by possible. humans yes. and human nature is not neutral. So, <laughs> so it, it is very hard. So that question encapsules right. the whole museological debate for the past 20 years, I would say. And there's no, so, I mean, there are solutions, but there is no real answer to that question. Right, right. And, and someone just asked a follow-up question, which is also impossible. How do you teach about other cultures without showing their objects? So yeah, it's, I mean, if, yeah, repatriation can mean that those objects are no longer some, you know, in another location to teach about another culture. So these are really, yeah, really difficult questions. Um, I think we'll go on to something easier, <laughs> which was the question about um, what did you do to fit in the two, fit the two long wall pieces that exceeded the height of your display space? So here's a very practical question, one without uh, too many moral implications. What were all of the, uh, intricate installation techniques you had to use to get those up. No, we we had to create like special roll so we can roll a part of the panel. And we had to deal with the, with the weight and, but I mean, it was difficult and it took a lot of people, but when you look at it, it's not, it's just like basic physics. Basic <laughs> yeah. physics. <laughs> you, you have to, you have to roll the quilt or the panel a little bit so it fits uh and rolling quilts is something that we normally do in our galleries when we had to highlight something specific that we want or the quilts are just too big and it was actually more difficult to hang the smaller panels because yeah why is that because this exhibition included only one-sided quilts and when you only have one layer they don't hang out well with a sleeve and slat system which is what we use normally for quilts right but normal quilts have three layers so they are most of quilts are very sturdy so you can hang them that way when they're just single layered we have to trace on foam board the exact shape of the quilt and create a board, special board for it. And these smaller panels 
were smaller than the other ones, but were huge <laughs> for a normal quilt. So it took a lot of logistics and every quilt in this exhibition has its custom made support. And right, uh, right. And yeah. hopefully, right, the, the, the idea is that all of those special mounts should disappear. No one should notice that they're there, right? Um, yep. All right. <laughs> So it's sort of like the pulling back the curtain on <laughs> exhibition design. Um, yep. Several people mentioned the prayer rugs. Um, one person, uh, I'm just mentioned the fact that the prayer rug from Pakistan in some ways resembled Hmong uh, textiles, and so I'll, that was just a comment. But um, I can, I think I know what you're talking about the the fine lined applique that you see in some uh, Hmong textiles is yes similar to the applique that is performed in Rahim Yarkhan in that part of Pakistan. It's really well known for, again, fine lined, very thin uh, sections of applique, very intricate. So yeah, I can see those visual similarities there. Um, someone else put a comment in the chat section about um, a resource related to place-based prayer rugs. So. Um, they, they put out a, a call if there are any other Muslims who are on this textile talk, listening to this textile talk besides them, they have a URL in, in the chat where you can, um, it's an initiative calling for Muslim creatives to, create, to craft a regional prayer rug that represents their location. So please, if anyone is interested in um, participating in that, if, if you are Muslim, or if you just wanna learn more about it, there is a URL there. That sounds fascinating to me because as I said, the, the three prayer rugs we included, which are just a, a small number of, of the prayer rugs you know, in the world, um, they each represent the, the place that they come from, the culture that they came out of so, uh, intimately, so specifically, that I would love to see what contemporary artists, contemporary Muslim artists, would do with that, um, with that sort of call to action. I think that's really interesting. Um, let's see. We only have about a minute left. I uh, Kipi Taraj has a question. How do you teach about other cultures without showing their objects? So that's a great. It, <laughs> Yeah, Can it, we answer that, that in that's a why it's a paradox. It, it, it is. It, it, it's museums are strange creatures. That are, it, it's very hard to get away from colonialism in museums because they're, well, it, it's just a very interesting discussion. And I really appreciate these questions because that is really what we discuss when we're creating these exhibitions. Many people think that just creating an exhibition is just, oh, this will look pretty here. And let's let's pick these objects because they're nice and they're pretty and they'll look awesome. And the amount of discussion that goes behind every exhibition, it, it it's is these kinds of questions that we try to do all the times among ourselves and the team and with other museums. So it, I'm, I'm very glad that those issues came up because that, that, that's what makes museums so interesting and so, I don't know. Thought provoking. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I, we're gonna have to end it there, but I think, yeah, that, that summarizes um sort of the issue at play is how do you create a, a space that imitates or mimics or evokes the feeling of place that you get in situ uh, where humans have been interacting uh, with each other and with the environment you know for a long time whether it's through textiles or not how do you do that there are so many questions there and we will have to um talk about them at another time, perhaps in another textile talk. So it is now two o'clock, time for us to end. Thank you to everyone for joining us today. I do just want to point out that next week's textile talk will be presented by Sakwa and the Wisconsin Museum of Quilts and Fiber Arts. 
and artist, uh, an artist from Japan. She's from Niigata, Japan. Akiko Ike will be talking about Boro Chiku Chiku. So it sounds like a really fascinating topic about Boro. So please join us next week. Thanks everyone.